Arratzaldeon, Arratzaldeon danoi, mesez, hartuko. Good afternoon, everyone. Please take a seat so I can start the afternoon session. No. Un guietorri. Good afternoon. I work at Iguidecha. I work in humanitarian support. Welcome, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the morning session. And now let's start the afternoon session. There are people connected via streaming as well. So let's hope we have a good afternoon session, continuing with this morning, where we had a lot of topics. And now we're going to continue to debate on these topics. Just one thing on the simultaneous translation. There's a video in Arabic, so there will be a moment when the Basque Spanish channel will be used to listen to the video that's in Arabic. So you can listen to it, and we're going to translate it into Spanish. It'll also be available in English. We're missing a, a, a booth due to technical reasons, so we apologize on behalf from the organization. So we're here in the translation in Spanish. In Spanish, sorry. On the assessment sheet, those of you here in person, in your folders, you have a sheet to evaluate the conference, so that so we can improve for next sessions. And those following us via streaming, there's a form that you can click on and fill in online. We would be grateful for your participation which always helps to improve our practices. Well, and then also mobile phones. We haven't heard any throughout the day, but please uh, turn your mobile phones off. So now let's start with the afternoon session, which is a roundtable of experiences. And we want it to be a panel where we can talk about all this, the proposals we've been supporting all these years with this panel, we want to meet three goals. On the one hand, it's to learn about several local organizations from some Basque entities that have been carrying out initiatives supported by El Anquideta over recent years and by Babao City Council too. This is a small sample of the social organizations we work, we've been working with in recent years. Another goal is to share and value all the work carried out by these organizations and to learn from their good practices and challenges and difficulties that they face when including the gender perspective in humanitarian action, which is what we're talking about here. And we also want to listen to the challenges and difficulties they face to create a dialogue, a shared reflection. I don't know if whether to look for solutions, but to have clues as to how to progress on this topic and to choose a uh, table for experiences is very difficult because we work with a lot of Basque organizations that work with local organizations. I would have loved to bring them all, but it was quite complicated. So we've made a selection following some criteria. On the one hand, it's geographical. We wanted there to be representation from Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East. We also wanted to, there to be representation of different types of organizations, smaller, more local organizations, international organizations, and also UN organizations, and which also had a more or less long track record working with El Anquilecha. So in that way, we chose eight organizations, although here you see representatives from four of them, to what well, we asked them to record a video lasting about three, four minutes uh, is a challenge to compile in such a short time all the experiences and difficulties in including the gender perspective in humanitarian action. And therefore, we're going to watch videos from eight organizations. Four of them are here, but others couldn't make it here. Some were able to connect, others weren't. But even so, we wanted to include their experiences. The organizations we chose were Geset from Kenya, which is Foundation for Health and Social Economic Development Africa, which we have here Eunice as a representative. We'll introduce her later. Ilanchi will do the introduction. Then we have the Central African Republic, and we'll listen to the testimony of 
United Nations Children's Fund. We don't have a representative here, but they have recorded a video. We'll also listen to the Development Support Association, APOYAD, located in Colombia. From Latin America, we have here a representative from Costa Rica, the Jesuit Migrant Service. And from the Middle East, on the one hand, we have the Popular Aid for Relief and Development, PARD, from Lebanon. The representative is here. Later, we'll introduce her. And we'll also have the experience, but though not the presence, of Andrua, someone who works there, also in Lebanon. From Palestine, we have the Agricultural Development Association, PARC. And also from Palestine, we have another testimony from the Union of Palestinian Women Committees, who, who has also recorded a video. And we left the original in Arabic, and later on, we'll have a translation. On the table, we all, on the panel, we all also have Iran Chumendia. She's a teacher of the Department of Sociology and Social Work of the University of the Basque Country. She's a director and researcher at EGOA in the research group on human security, local human development, and international cooperation. And her work focuses on feminist analysis of armed conflicts, peace building, transitional justice, and historical memory, with a particular interest in experiences such as El Salvador, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Guatemala, Colombia, and Western Sahara. And the Igor Institute, which is Institute of Studies on Developments and International Cooperation at the University of the Basque Country. Its work is the promotion of human development and international cooperation, on the one hand, providing research and analysis, documentation information resources, and also university training, capacity building for the strengthening of the social fabric of cooperation, as well as technical advice to public entities and institutions with, uh, to influence social change. So the dynamic, dynamic will be as follows. I will sure make a small introduction of the people on the panel. There are four representatives from eight of the experiences we're going to learn about. We'll watch the videos of, from four of them. We'll have a small break in case there are questions. Then we'll watch the videos of four more, and then we'll have a, a more. We'll have more room for questions and so on. The idea is, as you'll see in the videos, there are a lot of topics that are repeated, regardless of the context, and it's be able to look in the see if later on we can have a dialogue and reflection to see how we can overcome these difficulties. Well, thank you very much, and the, the floor is yours, Iran too. Well, thank you, Pilar. Edurne, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the agency for the invitation that they've extended to me. Well, I was a bit scared because I've never been a moderator, unless so on a panel for eight people. So once I've overcome this stage fight, they told me it was four, of course, but not eight. But anyway. It's a lot of people, but I'm very happy to be on this panel to act as a moderator, and I'll try to do my best. I'm going to move on to the introduction of these people. Eunice has more than has been working for over 20 years in various local and international aid agencies in Kenya and South Sudan. Her areas of expertise include planning monitoring and evaluation of projects, household economic analysis, participatory community research, enterprise development, donor coordination. You, and you see, you've got a lot of work because I haven't finished community resource management, community health education, and rural participatory methodologies. So I think it's an ex, she's an excellent representative of a practical experience of so many things that we've talked about yesterday and today. And she will participate in the video and later on in the discussion we'll have, and she'll talk about her work. Secondly, we have Adam, who I've just met as well, Adam Alvarez Calderon. He's the Director of Humanitarian Action and Inclusion Programs. He coordinates the work of the team and the implementation of direct assistance projects. 
capacity building and also projects to promote employability and income generation of the people who are being assisted in the Jesuit service. In the video, there will be another colleague, Karina Fonseca, the director. But with us, we have Adam today. If you want to add anything else about your, your own presentation. Uh, th in third place, we have Tamador Akil, who works in PARC, as Pilot said, his Agricultural Development Association from Palestine. He's worked in PARC since 2016. She's a coordinator of humanitarian projects and represents the represents PARC in the International Land Coalition. Coalition, the international network that includes the Middle East and near Africa region and deals with issues related to land and access to land for women and land property. She also represents the organization in the OCHA group, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, and issues on food security and protection. And to the le on the far left, we have Rita, who I haven't had the chance to meet yet. I'm doing so now. I'm delighted to meet you. We can chat later, maybe. Rita Hamdan is a Director General of Popular Aid for Relief and Development in Lebanon, with headquarters in Beirut. She's a Palestinian refugee in Lebanon and one of the founders of this organization. She's a human rights activist and advocate and with special emphasis on the rights of women and the Palestinian refugee population. She plays a very active role in the local NGO scene. She's a member of the N Saida NGO platform and the Palestinian NGO platform in Lebanon. Well, thank you all very much for being here, sharing your experiences with us. Now we're going to move on to watch the videos. My name is Inis Ngwawe. I'm the country director at Foundation for Health and Socioeconomic Development Africa also known as Sacred Africa, initiated in 2007 with headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya. We work with urban refugees as well as host community with a special focus on sexual and gender-based violence survivors. Our interventions focus on promoting access to quality healthcare services, sexual reproductive health rights, maternal and child health and nutrition, gender-based violence prevention and response, and provision of personal hygiene materials based on their practical gender needs. Gender mainstreaming requires us to include participation, coordination, prevention, and mitigation of gender-based violence for transformative and lasting change. In all our projects as Hesed Africa and our partners, we conduct participatory needs assessment at the beginning of projects, engage right holders, consult with county and sub-country authorities, and work within government policies and annual work plans. So in terms of coordination, that is linked to prevention, mitigation of gender-based violence. We work in close collaboration with community and government structures, the CSOs working in the, in the, in the location, community-based organizations, religious leaders, and institutions for community uh, advocacy, referrals, and linkages in matters of refugee needs, health, social protection, and legal matters. We engage with, in a GBV technical and monthly basis for linkages, referrals, information, and experience sharing. So in terms of transformative and lasting change, the SGBV survivors receive information, education, and practical skills, such as sewing, henna making, soap making, and food demonstrations. They also receive psychosocial and livelihood support for self-reliance, and such empowerment gives them the power to make financial and financial and household decisions. As we include the gender perspective, Para incluir el tema del género en el trabajo de todos los días, 
Tenemos varios retos delante de nosotras y son retos como la existencia de distintas prácticas culturales y normas de género entre refugees and sections of host communities uh, that put unequal expectations on masculinity and uh, femininity in the programs. Therefore, it requires us to engage in lobbying with our community and religious leadership and policymakers. On the other hand, it requires projects to have conversations with men, women, to demystify all the myths on these practices and the beliefs. There's also limited knowledge and capacity among the staff at various levels, at the community, the health centers, the schools, and within uh, the key stakeholders to apply gender transformative approaches in their work. We also have limited capacity in coordination of activities regarding health and SGBV referral pathways and experience sharing among key stakeholders. Such would be the, the police, where we do the reports, local leaders, the schools, health centers, counseling and legal services for the survivors. There's also lack of inclusion of gender lines in planning, monitoring, implementation and provision of services to the urban refugees and sexual and gender-based violence survivors. I am Marie Chantal Amoukoumaïen, Specialist for Protection of Children at the UNICEF RCA. I am based on the Bureau of Langue. The program of protection of children in the RCA has supported the government. The protection program for children calls to the protection of minors in situation of emergency, especially those used in armed conflicts. Our objective is to reinforce the access of girls to programs of recovery and reintegration of those children used by armed groups. Girls are usually used by uh, military people as wives, and sometimes they are used as spies as well. However, in the interest of uh, these armed groups, groups do not consider them uh, children associated to them. So we include them in reintegration programs. UNICEF has found a solution by applying the inverse methodology. This is a mechanism based on the community to identify those children. At community level, these girls become sensi very sensitive about their own communities, what needs they have, if they have awareness about those specific decisions and see how to find a way to reintegrate them. At global level, before 2012, those girls represented 12% of the children that had been identified within armed groups. However, after a community approach by UNICEF, which reduced this percentage of girls associated to armed forces to 5.5% of a, a total of 17,000 children. The financing terms of the projects have are, are of eight to 12 months, something which is not favoring the reinsertion of those uh, girls since uh, the training uh, lasts for longer than that. Both for girls and for both, uh, and for boys, we have to say that in the case of girls, they limit their chances of election of a profession as they usually choose to be hairdressers, sewing, and they do not choose uh, other things, other works like uh, mechanics or carpenters or things like those. And what do boys do? Within this framework, in order to be capable of reinserting the girls who are victims of sexual violence and they are stigmatized by the society as they have suffered sexual abuse by the leaders of the armed groups, the, they themselves do not speak about these experiences 
not when they're in the app group, nor when they come out. So they don't have enough social support and they are rejected by their communities due to the violence they have suffered themselves. And when they leave, the community rejects them. So Gloria Patricia. My name is Gloria Patricia Vergara. I work at the Association of Support to Development, Apoyar, as technical director. Our organization is located in the Department of Arauca in Colombia, uh, in the border with Venezuela. We implement social projects with uh, different communities. Principally, we develop the work here in the Department of Arauca. We carry out this exercise of inclusion of uh, the gender approach in the work in both in two ways. First, with the uh, teams. With them, we start a whole process with its uh, project team, a whole process of understanding what the gender approach means. And with the communities, based on the dialogue of knowledge, we carry out a, an analysis and see what the gender gaps are within the communities. And in this exercise, we start to uh, bring down all that theoretical concepts and conceptual concept that implies uh, gender issues. And then from gender equalities, we go down to the particular realities in group by having a dialogue. This is our best practice in the sense of in understanding and uh, getting down, uh, going down to how to get information about this inequality and working with this group of women. We've been working with them for a long time in the project, uh, in the framework of these projects with Oxfam. And we have a methodology called the words of women, and this consists that the women have to assess all their activities throughout through the day, which of them are paid, which of them are not. And at the end of the day, they identify first the number of hours they devote to working, paid or unpaid. And then we separate the hours that are paid work from the other hours which are uh, unpaid work. It's very satisfactory for women to understand that with their unpaid work, they are making a huge contribution to their families, to sustaining their families. And this gives them a new value for the things and has allowed them to be better at bargaining, not only with their partners, but also within their families, because this gives them an explanation of why they are so tired at the end of the day. A difficulty we have is that not all um, project teams have the capacity to understand or to, or to see the gender approach as part of a process, but they only see it as part of the activities of a project and that's it. This implies the gender approach implies also having some insights at personal level. We facilitate the, those spaces for the teams to think, to reflect on things, but the changes depend on each person. And on the other hand, this practice of having this only in the activities of the project comes from work experiences in other organizations uh, on behalf of the staff where they are asked only to do the activities according to certain features and not following a process of self-critical uh, thinking. My name is Karina Fonseca. I'm national director of the service Jesuit Service for Migrants in Costa Rica. We work all over the country and our uh, headquarters are in the capital, San Jose. Costa Rica is the main interregional uh, part of uh, Central America. We get people coming from Nicaragua mainly, but also from Salvador, Honduras, Colombia, Venezuela, and many people who are traveling in Central America on their way to the United States. First, the importance we give to the strengthening of uh, team capabilities, having training spaces, awareness spaces, self-care spaces in order to work more efficiently in the acknowledgement of vulnerabilities uh, based on gender, the situation faced by women and girls displays, the situation of trans or elderly women, that kind of support requires no doubt a constant training permanent training on behalf of our team. 
Secondly, innovation and creativity how we can see what are the groups in uh, with the greatest vulnerability and risk and design actions coordinated with other actors, for instance, supermarkets, the banking system and other organizations in order to give a response, adequate response to these needs. For instance, in the case of a woman who's in a circle of violence and requires some intervention where we can prevent her from being in at greater risk when she comes to Costa Rica. And finally, the comprehensive nature of our services, uh, on uh, apart from on top of um, an immediate answer, in many cases, there are displaced people who are running away from very complex situations and we give them support in the um, uh, regulation of their status, the, the possibility of identifying psychological supports or also providing spaces for them to start some entrepreneurship in the country. How to put the processes over the project by acknowledging that this is an instant that requires international cooperation, the dynamics of different projects, but we have to keep in mind that the first thing we have to do is to support people who are highly vulnerable, girls, adolescents, adult women, LGBTIQ plus population, which requires a systematic work, continuous work during a specific period for their recomposition and their establishment in Costa Rica will uh, be done or is done in the most appropriate way possible. This is essential processes over uh, and above projects by recognizing, acknowledging our li limitations, but also establishing a route towards autonomy and the improvement of the life conditions of these people. And secondly, how to take all these elements that we find in direct support, vulnerabilities, risks, the institutional problems and bring them to the political instances in the country so that uh, there is a chance to have important structural change changes in the country. My name is Inis Nguawe. Bueno, listo. Eh, hemos... Okay, ready. We've been able to see four presentations here as Pilar said before and we've seen it on the video these are capsules three minute capsules so it's impossible to translate everything you do in such a short period of time there's a clear structure of the interventions that can help us maybe direct uh, or contact this space because the questions were about good practices, best practices, because it's, it's things that you consider positive and has very good or positive results because they have an impact on uh, the lives of people. Because this is what we uh, are looking for. What's the impact, the transforming impact on the lives of people with the difficulties, of course, that we sometimes have and so sometimes the actions are done in a very short periods of time. Best practices also because we tend to feel overwhelmed by difficulties, challenges, and there were questions about this as well. But over and above that, talking about best practices will shed light on the issue, will allow to see ourselves in different mirrors from other cultures, from other countries. And I'd like to start by opening up this space, by suggesting a topic to start talking, but opening up this space for some uh, first reactions, maybe the audience here or the people who are attending online. It'll be a brief space in this first round of about 15 minutes. And then we will go and see the other four videos and we will listen uh, another four people. And after that, we will have a much wider space uh, to go on. So if you think this might be an interesting format, otherwise you can propose something different. In the experiences presented so far as a challenge, 
They were speaking about the inner work which is done within the teams, within the projects. Because yesterday and today we have been looking at the work with people, with the communities. But what happens within the organization? Do we promote, foster this organizational change in terms of gender? Do we apply this to ourselves, uh, this gender approach? Uh, this thing we try to apply to the people we and community we work with. Do we try? Are we successful or not? Maybe we could have a look at that part of the inner work within the community. Sometimes in organizations which are mixed organizations, it, it can carry um, along some other difficulties. Maybe maybe a majority of the people who are here, well, maybe you, Rita, uh, are you in a mixed organization? Or are there men and women, both men and women? Yeah, it's a mixed organization. So if you think it fit for any of you to talk about this, I would like to propose this idea. How do you work internally? What are the nodes you can think of? Uh, what things are be to be unlocked? Before we have, I have been talking to Adam as well. The, the question, someone's question about how the masculinity is worked within these organizations. Are there steps uh, towards more positive uh, masculinities? We can speak a little bit about this. Yes. Do you think it's all right? Yeah. For our situation, for example, in uh, in Kenya, uh, this the, the gender balance, uh, the gender equality, uh, runs from. I am in the organization. There are other ladies in the organization. We have men in in the from the board, and also within the working uh, the workings, but also key um, who we call the health promoters who work with us in the community structure. And these are persons who are very key because um, they're like our sustainability and also the front line in the community. So we, ha we purpose to have men, really, because in the situation, for example, we work in um, respecting the religious aspect where we have uh, information that needs to go to the mosques. So then it is a man who would then use the Friday or prayer time to pass this information. Uh, and so we leverage on the, the, on the strengths of the, of the gender as it plays um, among the staff or in delivering of, uh, of various, uh, various projects. So I would stop there for now in terms of uh, leveraging uh, staffing. To, to be able to reach uh, the various populations. Uh, respecting the dynamics of uh, ch you need to change, change takes time, uh, and also, um, so, so yeah, that's what we really do. Mm -hmm. Bueno, eh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Uh, based on this question, it came up today at some point, and it is related to part of what someone has mentioned in the videos about the strengthening of uh, capacities for teams. I think there's processes which are differentiated between men and women, and you have to de construct a series of ideas, beliefs, practices about how to have a hegemonic masculinity and there, as we know, there's a violence structures which are very patri patriarchal in the case of Central America and these processes there are slow, are difficult, they cannot be done overnight and this poses a clear difficulty because the work of the organizations uh, you have to do interventions where you need to act in a very efficient way and also very quickly. And in the video, someone mentioned that 
there isn't always a chance to go on to carry on with uh, some processes and in our case we've tried not only to involve men who are part of the team and so we can address some specific aspects of transformational change not only within the sphere of work it's a construction that applies to different spaces in the houses at home with our girlfriends with our families with the people we interact with uh, on a daily basis and how to identify in selection processes some aspects that may be indicators or indicative of uh, and this is always very difficult to think that in a selection of this stuff you can cover everything the whole range but we try in order to spot not to hire some people who may have uh, a path who is more slower, who are not interested in, in moving forward. We have to be realistic and some people do not want to move forward or they, they don't want to recognize that there's a gender gap or gender bridge. And it's important to address that as well. <coughs> and with uh, sustaining the teams, we have to, we need to have a gradual process. It, it's important to acknowledge that we never, this is what I think, you never reach a situation where something is completely deconstructed because I think it's an ongoing process. I'd like to add, not for you to answer this question now, but, but because this may affect our credibility and legitimacy when we go and try to carry out a gender analysis or try to plan uh, based on gender. It's a question of coherence, internal coherence. Okay, Tamador, would you like to say anything? Uh, as uh, an organization, Bark is uh, uh, like um, uh, it's not like uh, uh, for, uh, working for only for uh, for gender and for women. It's a mixed organization, and uh, gender equality is uh, one of our programs we have, and of course it's a cross-cutting uh, program with other sectors. Uh, but as an organization, uh, we try to uh, to have like a safe working environment for uh, uh, for uh, for women. Um, uh, we, uh, we suggest uh, we like in, uh, encourage the uh, not uh, uh, having um, uh, unsafe uh, uh, harass uh, unsafe environment uh, working environment, and uh, we try to uh, to have give. Uh, um, uh, equal opportunities for uh, for women to apply for the work, uh, equal uh, uh, equal like salaries uh, between men and women, uh, equal competition for uh, any uh, uh, like job uh, position we have. Uh, also trying not trying uh, making sure that. Uh, uh, gender equality is applied for all the programs, all the projects we have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. Uh, in, in Lebanon, in, in general, uh, the males are more oriented towards uh, private businesses <coughs> because the NGOs, they don't pay high salaries. <laughs> in general, I'm not talking about international NGOs, local NGOs. Anyhow, uh, but in spite of this, we have uh, uh, men working with us in the organization, and this is good because the, it shows that they have a certain type of dedication towards uh, belief and, and freedom issues, uh, and that's why they come and work in, in our NGO. So it's not the salary, basically. Uh, to main, gender mainstreaming uh, uh, is uh, going on, of course, in the organization, starting with the bylaws, the internal laws, whereby both sexes are protected against harassment and things like that. Uh, we have, uh, like the rest of the organizations, equality in, in salaries and opportunities. So it is all there. Uh, at, the, at the field level, uh, the, the, we have a, a, a big number of male vo volunteers. Mm -hmm. So at the organizational level, 
the, the women are the majority, but at the volunteer level, we have a great number of uh, male uh, volunteers working with us. So, uh, of course, uh, the men, there, uh, the, uh, yani, and anything related to gender mainstreaming uh, is there at the organizational level and at the program level. ¿A qué atribuyes que hay más voluntarios hombres? Why do you think there are more uh, male who are volunteers? Why do you think they uh, male males volunteer more than women? The the reason behind this is not good. <laughs> the the majority of the young people with with whom we are working and yeah, the target groups, they don't find work because they are refugees. And secondly, they don't have many opportunities uh, uh, mm -hmm. to find the work or, or even to continue their uh, education. Mm -hmm. so, so they are sitting there around, you know, in, in, the, in the target areas. And uh, very often they are happy to work with, uh, with us as volunteers for very small fees to, uh, to support them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gracias a los cuatro. Si me gustaría, si... Thank you to the four. If in the room... There are people from lots of organizations, I'll be, and if you want to share anything related to this, maybe more an internal processes of change in terms of gender transformation, which in the end have a positive impact on the work we do uh, outwards. Or do you want to watch the next videos? Well, so we can carry on with the videos, because later we'll have a space for listening, a bit, a bit of a more a broader space to to talk about this and other issues. My name is Rita Hamdan, and I'm the General Director of the Popular Aid for Relief and Development Part. <coughs> Our main office is in the capital of Lebanon, Beirut. Our subject population reaches about 40,000 Palestinian and Syrian refugees, in addition to poor Lebanese families living in 27 informal settlements in Tyr, Saida, and Beirut. We target women, male and female young people, men and children. Part six groups of women who are the most marginalized and vulnerable so that interventions address their specific needs and concerns. For the past 37 years, PART has been working in the informal Palestinian settlements in Lebanon. We place a special emphasis on empowering and supporting local women and working to redress power imbalances by providing women with more autonomy. PART has developed a comprehensive training program that aims to strengthen the women and youth communities in decision-making and problem-solving. They acquire basic skills in managing, planning, and implementing activities related to their own needs and the needs of their families and communities, and in advoca advocating and lobbying uh, for their rights as women and youth and as refugees. We should clarify that Palestinian and Syrian women refugees in Lebanon lack access to rights and to equi equitable development, assets and sources of income, even within their own communities. Female refugees face double discrimination, externally for their refugee status and internally for their position as women. Not only barred from participating in Lebanon's politics, refugee women also find themselves excluded from participating effectively and democratically in the Palestinian popular committees, which are the internal decision-making bodies responsible for the overall running of the Palestinian camps and informal settlements. The women committees in these informal settlements differ from the popular committees for several reasons. Firstly, the popular committees are composed of almost entirely men who are appointed by political parties. These communities and, and the popular committees themselves were not originally very open to the idea of women committees. In fact, in most informal settlements, there is a heavy competition over governing authority because while the popular committees are the technical governing bodies in those communities, 
practically, practically the women committees have more influence in some places. My name is Ali Samaya. I work as the GBV officer at the protection unit at the UNRWA Lebanon field office. We work with uh, the Palestine refugees from Lebanon and Palestine refugees from Syria. UNRWA over the past years has worked to mainstream prevention and response to GBV into our core programs. For example, in our health clinics, all our staff have been trained on uh, safe identification and referrals of cases of sexual and gender-based violence. And since we are aware of the strong links between uh, GBV and mental health, we have included GBV in our mental health program uh, by, by uh, including GBV into the mental health screening that is done with uh, most of our patients. Recognizing the link between GBV and mental health, we have also engaged uh, men and women in the community on psychological support group sessions in order to strengthen their resilience and to address root causes of violence. In our education program, school counselors have not only been trained on safe identification and referrals of GBV, they also provide awareness sessions to students on caregivers on topics such as uh, child marriage and its risks. We combine the community-based approach uh, with mainstreaming, for example, when women committees who consist of volunteers from the community and who we trained on topics related to gender equality and GBV, target children in UNRWA schools in their awareness sessions and campaigns. COVID-related lockdowns and an increase in protests due to the economic crisis with road closures, fuel shortages, electricity cuts, closures of our installations due to violent incidences have caused severe disruptions of our uh, ability to deliver services and to implement our activities. This means that we have to constantly uh, readjust our planning and mitigate the impact that this situation has on our population, on the population we serve and, uh, and our services or activities. Uh, for example, during the first COVID-related lockdown, we shifted uh, most of our work to online modalities and reach people through WhatsApp or other channels. Being aware of an increase of domestic violence uh, during the lockdown, we have uh, shared hotlines of child protection and GBV and mental health uh, NGOs and as well our own hotlines with community members through WhatsApp through ch ch and they we share them uh, with, with other community members. Hello, my name is Tamar Dorakel. I work as the project coordinator for humanitarian action uh, in Bark, Palestinian Agriculture Development Association. Uh, our main office located in Ramallah, West Bank, Palestine. Uh, we have branches in all the West Bank and in Gaza. Uh, most of our work with uh, uh, most marginalized people or groups uh, in rural in rural area with the special focus in area C. In uh, area C, uh, we work with the farmers, uh, women, and youth. Bark uh, work on the selection criteria for beneficiary for land rehabilitation activities. Our main intervention with the, uh, with the humanitarian action is land rehabilitation. And uh, due to the land ownership problems in Palestine, we faced lack or limited number of uh, application, uh, application received by women. To avoid this problem, we uh, worked on the selection criteria, improve it to have more inclusion for uh, women and uh, participation for women. So we uh, give um, uh, we give a high score for uh, for women who uh, applied with uh, uh, land, uh, who owns land or in the process of registration this land or they have land but in the, uh, they need uh, they need uh, the resources economic resources or uh, social resources to register this land and their names. Uh, also uh, we give a higher 
score or uh, uh, a balance for uh, for women who can prove that they are the main uh, provider, uh, the main provider for uh, their families, even that they don't uh, have uh, lands. The second good practices we have is the uh, the CPCs, Community Protection Group, which is uh, a balanced uh, gender groups consists of 15 to uh, 20 members working together in serving their community voluntary. Uh, these groups have uh, participated or usually participating in uh, capacity building programs, uh, trainings, uh, providing them with some equipment needed uh, to do their uh, services. Uh, these uh, capacity building programs <coughs> are uh, documentation, human rights uh, laws, uh, human uh, the rights of people with disabilities, uh, and uh, other trainings. Uh, in, through this uh, CBC, we insist about uh, and taking care of women participation, and this was uh, useful uh, through the uh, the COVID lockdown in 2021. Uh, the role of women was enormous in helping their communities. Also, uh, the role of women are obvious in uh, uh, the local committees for the project and uh, other uh, services. In Palestine, land ownership is uh, mostly owned by men and women ownership is low. Uh, the, the latest statistic shows that women uh, land ownership is uh, uh, 3 to 5 percent, uh, almost 3 to 5 percent. Even so, that the agriculture sector is the most uh, uh, or the largest employer for women in uh, agriculture, with almost uh, 35 percent, uh, uh, 5 percent of uh, women working in the agriculture sector. Meanwhile, the, uh, the land uh, ownership or agriculture land ownership owned by women, 6.7. This shows that the, uh, that the large Largest or the biggest uh, own uh, belongs uh, or owners belong to men. Uh, the second obstacle we face in our work is uh, women participation in different activities uh, such as uh, trainings, uh, workshops, uh, exchange visit uh, due to different uh, factors such as social factors, religious and uh, economical factors. Uh, and more, uh, not in all communities we face this, but in the most uh, strict and conservative community we face this most than other. أنا اسمي تغري الجمعة ناشطة نسوية ومدافعة عن حقوق الإنسان رئيس مجلس إدارة جمعية عايشة لحماية المرأة والطفل وعضو متطوع في العديد من الجمعيات أعمل كمدير تنفيذي الاتحاد لجان المرأة الفلسطينية شاركت في العديد من المؤتمرات الدولية والمحلية وقدمت خلالها العديد من أوراق العمل والندوات حول أوضاع المرأة الفلسطينية ومعاناتها والحقوق المسلوبة للنساء الفلسطينيات استطعت تجنيد العديد من الأصدقاء من خارج فلسطين لإيصال صوتنا ومعاناتنا تحت الاحتلال ودعم ومساندة المرأة الفلسطينية تشكل تدخلات العمل الإنساني في الأوقات العادية وأوقات الطوارئ من منظور النوع الاجتماعي أحد الركائز الأساسية للاتحاد حيث يسعى الاتحاد من خلال التخطيط وتحديد الاحتياجات والتنفيذ إلى مراعاة إدماج النوع الاجتماعي وفق الأسس الأممية لسيما المعايير الإنسانية الأساسية والمعايير الدنيا للإدماج تعميم قيم المساواة وعدم التمييز بين الجنسين من ناحية ومن ناحية أخرى تبني ناج تشاركي مبني على تقوية النساء السياسية والمدنية ليصبحنا أكثر قدرة على ممارسة حقوقهم والمطالبة في تعزيز مكانتهم الاجتماعية والسياسية هذا كله من خلال رؤية استراتيجية للاتحاد ومن النساء في مجتمعات ما زالت النظرة والمفاهيم الذكورية تشكل المساحة الأكبر the other great challenge is the fact we have to live under the military occupation, which involves a scenery with uh, killings, detention, and a high rate of unemployment and lack of opportunities. In this context, there's instability and unsafety for women, children, and girls, and this has a direct impact on their psychological and health states, as well as on the progress at all levels. All of this makes that uh, women, boys and girls are in a constant state of unsafety and instability and makes it necessary for them to give them a permanent support. I am a physical and a mental health. Secondly, the 
مما يعيق من حركة النساء وقدرتهم على الخروج من غزة وخاصة النساء اللواتي بحاجة إلى علاج في الخارج وهذه الأوضاع تؤثر على التقدم في أوضاع المرأة على جميع المستويات الأوضاع الاقتصادية ارتفاع نسبة البطالة خاصة في صفوف النساء حيث بلغت البطالة بين النساء في السنوات الأخيرة 40% من مجموع نسب البطالة وهي النسبة الأعلى في صفوف النساء عنه في الذكور القوانين التمييزية ضد النساء والتي تصادر حقوقهم الاجتماعية والصحية ولا تحقق المساواة بين الجنسين إضافة لذلك أن مجتمعنا هو مجتمع ذكوري يقوم على التمييز بين الجنسين كل ما سبق يجعل النساء في حالة من عدم الاستقرار وعدم الأمان والحاجة الدائمة إلى الدعم والإسنان Well, we've heard uh, about the four experiences. Uh, so I would like to return to another issue that's a common denominator that and ha that has arisen in several experiences this afternoon, also this morning, and it's that of the demand for their own spaces for women. In the case of Rita, you mentioned the creation of committees, of women's committees, uh, uh, apart from the popular Palestinian committees, which have already have a legitimacy and a political authority, because the people who belong to those committees are men and these are men who are there because the political parties uh, appoint them. But you talked about how, uh, women's committees having their own spaces, and in certain areas they have even more influence, you say. Could you talk a bit more about this greater influence? What's the source of legitimacy or authority that women have when they truly have a space to be able to grow collectively? which is something that, of course, we've learned from the feminist movement. The, uh, feminist self-awareness groups, uh, they have their own spaces, which lead to results, and we know that they help. So what's your specific experience with these committees? Why are they more influential? to take the opportunity to thank the agency for inviting us to share in this uh, workshop, uh, the learning workshop, I call it. Um, as for the women committees, uh, how, how did they come about? Yani, how, how do we have women committees? Uh, the, the idea started with, the, with the cer certain activities, like, for example, raising awareness for the women groups. Uh, combating illiteracy among the women groups, um, <coughs> making children activities. So we have animators for children activities. All those type of act activities brought several women together, several women together in each gathering alone. And uh, they, they decided that they want to do more for their communities. So in order to do more for the communities, they need skills. So that's why we, we come with the training on empowerment, training on empowerment, and communication skills, conflict resolution skills, map, mapping their community, uh, how to uh, present their cases, what they need. Uh, all such of uh, trainings was necessary. And then they formed something called women committees. The popular committees who are mostly men, <laughs> because they are actually uh, imposed by the political parties, they are not even elected. They did not like the idea very much to have active women committees uh, 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 sharing in decision making and problem solving. <coughs> it's, it's like they're taking their place. <laughs> and actually, the women committees uh, uh, tried to communicate with the popular committees, the men, to show them that we are not competing for, for, for power. We are competing for the sake of improving our living conditions in the gatherings. 
But actually, no, uh, it is really a competition in the balance of power. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the women committees uh, would not like to be members in the popular committees because maybe the reputation of the popular committees has problems. <laughs> so they work independently alone, uh, together with part. Now we, we don't own them. We uh, uh, work together with them. So they, they are not part employees. They are independent women committees who do a lot of good work in decision making and in problem solving. We support them and other NGOs also support them. And they are actually very strong. And I just want to mention here, even in the cases of uh, disasters, in Lebanon, you know, every year, we, every second year, we have a disaster. Mostly uh, Israeli aggression, wars, things like that, or internal uh, fighting and so on and so forth. In these cases, you know, we have a lot of people who are displaced. Even the refugees are become displaced. Lebanese become displaced from area to area. The women committees I'm talking about, they play a major role in peace times and also in, during disasters. They come together into certain areas, like, like for example, public school, public school where the uh, internally displaced are uh, put, and they start uh, organizing things, especially for women. They start, they, they form women committees in the displacement centers alone. And they start to look into the needs of the women. What are the needs of the displaced women, whether, uh, whether they are refugees or Lebanese. So they look into pregnant women, what they need, uh, if, there are, if there is breastfeeding or not, they, 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 they fix this problem. Uh, they make sure that women have separate toilets, that they are clean. They do everything needed for the displaced people as uh, women committees, because they have this experience before they became uh, displaced. So in peaceful times, they are very active, but also during disasters, they are very active. I wanted uh, to highlight uh, this point. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered your question. Sure. <laughs> you Thank you so much. I think you want to speak? Yeah, I was going to share some like uh, good practices for uh, the women participation in public spaces uh, we apply. Um, like in addition to but what uh, BARC do, we have a consortium called an action group consists of three organizations. Um, we have VAG, which is uh, more related to WASH activities. We have VACCW, is more uh, organization with psychosocial support. As a consortium, we work together, uh, of course, with uh, our Spanish uh, organization or international, the SBB. And uh, it, it, mostly our work, uh, like for BARC, focus on livelihood and uh, food security activities like land rehabilitation. Uh, so before uh, like implementing any project, we do the assessment, which is uh, contain like focus group with women, uh, and with women alone, and we have focus group with mixed uh, mixed group like men and women to have their opinion about to about the needs uh, they want. Also, we, we usually when we have a project, we start the implementation. We have the local committees, which is consist of uh, uh, like five or seven uh, persons, uh, men and women, and they start to uh, start with the implementation of process like uh, selection of beneficiary, um, um, identifying uh, needs for the, their uh, their communities, and. Um, the other thing we have uh, called the CBC, Community Protection Group, which is uh, having the BVCA and the DRR approach, uh, which is the planning for the community disaster, uh, disaster risk plans, uh, reduction plans. And uh, they usually, um, these groups are um, uh, balanced, the group uh, between uh, men and uh, women. Uh, they have uh, many trainings I mentioned in the video and um, uh, they have usually they vote on the priorities their community need for uh, their needs and uh, their risk they face, uh, giving equal opportunities to, uh, for men and women to vote on this activity, uh, these uh, risks. Mm -hmm. That's Retomo una... I'll return to something, the experience you presented Tamador, is that the right way to say it? In the sense that you have a positive discrimination policy, you have a 
when selecting that population you're going to work with. So therefore, do you prioritize work with women who have real possibilities of control over land and ownership of land, and also women who are the, the, the main supporters of their families or the heads of families. So to bring something from your experience, which would be relevant within the feminist movement, these positive actions are part of the policies that are demanded. So you take that to your organization. Yes. Let's say in 2017-2018, we started with this activity, the land rehabilitation. Uh, the first project was funded by the Catalan Agency. Uh, when we have started selection the process for uh, uh, for beneficiary, we received more than 100 bene application form to get benefited from this project, and we discovered that uh, we have like five or six uh, application are submitted by women. Uh, so we. Um, uh, as um, we, the uh, meal department we have and uh, our team, the project coordinators, like gather together, uh, gather and start to like review the selection criteria. What's wrong with the selection criteria? And we discover that uh, we are focused about the ownership for lands. And the statistics showed, showed in Palestine that the land ownership is mostly by men. Uh, the work done by women, but if they don't <coughs> own uh, the land. Uh, and this was before uh, the project uh, launching. There is a project launched by the government in Palestine called the Tabo, which is registering the land in their uh, original owners, uh, which is, I don't know if you are familiar, like religious, uh, Islamic religious, is it, uh, is that the, uh, the women uh, have uh, the half of the share of the men. So, like uh, two women will have the same, um, will have uh, as um, one man. So uh, this is giving, even it's like uh, even not giving yeah, equal uh, opportunities for women to have uh, their heritage, but at least they have uh, uh, an opportunity to have a priority, a property owned by them. Uh, so the government started this project in 2018, and the. Now, statistics shows that there is a difference. Uh, there is higher uh, percentage for women for lands owned by women, but until now we don't have any statistic released by the government to show numbers. Uh, but according to our experience, if we want to compare with the first project we have, like in 2017, we have two to three percent women participating in our project. Now we have almost 16 percent of, uh, of uh, women participation or benefited from this project. So one of the uh, positive discrimination uh, mm -hmm. criteria. Mm -hmm. So there's also a cause effect relationship between taking the measure and the results you get in the sense. Yeah. See. I'd like to highlight three very particular examples and maybe dealing with some of the more general topics that Karina mentioned on the video and they are related also to the question that has been uh, coming up and with the direct participation of people in the decision making process, not only uh, participating as bene beneficiaries in, in the projects. And I'd like to highlight this because this took place in the framework of support with uh, the Basque government. And I'd like to use the, this opportunity to thank them for uh, their support to people in Central America. Uh, the first example has to do with something that Karina mentioned in the video. She mentioned something about supermarkets and maybe it wasn't very clear what she meant. When my female colleagues start talking to women, and we have to understand that the dynamics of bringing people to Costa Rica is different from other contexts because there's a historical migration from population from Nicaragua, and there's a very big community of uh, Nicaraguan uh, population, but there's also a, a number of other nationalities. But in particular with women from Nicaragua, 
and some from El Salvador. My female colleagues uh, could spot that giving some cash uh, support in order to cover some costs or to cover some uh, food expenses. It was not necessarily a good practice because several of these people came to Costa Rica and they were uh, they had uh, they were staying with someone they know with some friends with some relatives someone their family in Nicaragua knew so in the emergency they uh, get these people in their house but they also have some conditions for instance they had to contribute uh, money in order to buy food they said okay if we bring the money that distribution of how the money will be used, the, the choice will not be ours, but of the person who have us in their homes. And uh, when we ask them who is the one who ultimately makes the decision, it's usually other women. It's not other women, but it's a man who has a greater power over the income who uh, gets into that household or he can say some part of the money will be for food but some part of this money will go to other things which may not be things that benefit people because they can use them even for personal issues and this led us to think well maybe it's not good if we have um, things uh, like giving them uh, um, goods because there are things that some people uh, do not consume even if in Central America we are small countries and we have common features but of course there are differences and we have to respect them. So we found an alternative which has been good for us so far. For instance in some cases we give them support for food which is having having some agreements with supermarkets where we can have a, a card by means of which they can directly go there and buy whatever they need. They can choose the products they want to buy. And this is something good. In Central America, it's very common to deliver this food support and in a way, this is a vision of what organizations think they have to give to people. But sometimes that's not what people want. And I'm linking this with the topic of the supermarkets. And I think this is related to how we can incorporate the good practice of listening to the people and of acknowledging their needs. A second example has to do with the female colleagues uh, who work with psychology, social psychology, they have some groups who have insights with women of survivors of uh, gender-based violence um, and they have their rights and they can have psychosocial support in order to face uh, the trauma of the situations they have lived, not only in their original countries, but also while in transit and maybe sometimes when they are in Costa Rica. And here it's been very important that the female colleagues have had a participatory methodology where the participants said the contents they wanted to have in that space, which may not be necessarily the ones that the organization had planned. And obviously in projects, and this is quite difficult as well to, to bring into the projects in their uh, comprehensive spirit, sometimes we have to uh, see if uh, there's something important for the organization. But maybe for women, uh, some things are not very relevant. For instance, uh, if they want to have more session about specific issues, in this case, they wanted to address or have additional sessions of, talki of uh, topics related to health access, sexual health access, and having some support and buying some kits of products which they could not have uh, for free. And maybe buying them directly is very expensive and they don't have the resources to do so. And I think there we have some space to adapt the processes to the real needs and the real demands and that this space finally looks more like uh, the people who are in it. 
and so that the space is what these people want it to be because they are building this, co-building this space. A third example, and this is going to be my last, in Costa Rica, there are different groups representative of part of the civil society before the state institutions, for instance, the advocacy for inhabitants with some institutions that have some mandate linked to the migrant dynamics in the country. However, there aren't too many spaces that are directly organized or represented by migrant uh, persons. And uh, this is quite concerning, something that has come up uh, for some time now. Uh, why in these spaces we cannot have some of us, why does it have to be always the people working in the organizations or people sometimes who do not even work in the organizations and belong to the UN and have a more strategic level or vision uh, and they don't have much contact with people in uh, on a daily basis and so understand more their sort of community inclusions. Uh, and in this sense, Something we have developed is the creation of a citizen's council against a forced displacement. We know this is relevant. It's not an instant that we will have a chance to get constituted as part of a whole institutional st structure, but we can start uh, building it. We have been listening in spaces of dialogue in order to know and we want to design this space, how it should be, what it should look like, what are the aspects or the main access it may have in order to present uh, to the institutions and also support ourselves as an organization that have uh, the access to institutions and then so enable them to participate in space in, in these spaces and sometimes in gaining spaces that are not available today and that we need to develop also due to the greater amount of people that have been uh, arriving and this is a feature of migration in Costa Rica is a non-temporary migration in many cases it's a permanent migration for several years Currently, given the impossibility of many people to go back to Nicaragua with a dictator regime, it makes it impossible for many people to go back there even if they would like to because they, their life would be in danger. And we have this issue of the citizen council. We are discussing about the term itself, but the, this element of citizenship is key because we... Uh, regardless of uh, whether you're a migrant and regardless of your nationality, you are a citizen and this is very relevant. And this is something that has to do with borders in a region like Central America where there are many peoples that link all of us there. Well, I'm, I'm uh, picking up on this, you have said, because this brings me back to a conversation we've had while having land, Eunice, and then the colleague from Farmamundi, Begoña, and Shune, who's in, the, in here, about contexts. I was wondering how determining the migratory policies of countries are, how relevant they are, the relevance of having increasingly restrictive laws when they are not directly repressive laws, the impact it has on the work that is carried out. And I, I was asking Eunice a question because these very restrictive policies, like the ones in Europe, account for societies that are not very solidarity, don't have much solidarity when welcoming other people. And I was asking about the case in Kenya and the work they are doing in Nairobi from Jesse, how society perceives these people who come from Congo, who come from, she told me, from Ethiopia, sorry, from Somalia, I think you mentioned, 
how that um, welcome is from a social point of view. Thank you very much. And apart from that, uh, I would like to add, because in Kenya at the moment, I think best even in the global um, uh, sector, we have the what we call the CRRF. Uh, this is where we want uh, durable solutions for the for the refugees, and uh, one of the solutions is a settlement within the countries uh, where they are currently living in. So. Through lobbying with other um, refugee working groups uh, led by the UNHCR, we, uh, there are processes that are ongoing. And uh, looking at, uh, we mentioned the transformative change uh, from the whole morning and yesterday as part of the, one of the approaches that we really need to encompass. And uh, listening to the other panelists and the stories, we realize there's that part of uh, income generation, uh, the farming, um, some income coming to the table, improvement of the livelihoods of, of these uh, the refugees or, or at risk or the already vulnerable. So like in our situation, for example, we have this program where we, uh, we train uh, the women some of them come with the skills already uh, that they would uh, they had from their countries, but we polish the skill for them so that they're able to live within the urban <coughs> to gain some livelihoods. And uh, this is like what she mentioned before: the basic skills in soap making, in just beauty and henna, um, or just and then they do tailoring. And the tailoring, what we also linked it with the personal hygiene. We also uh, taught them how to do reusable sanitary pads. And, and this was a big situation for, uh, for our girls in the in, informal, whether they were refugees or, or Kenyans, they, had a, they have a big gap in, in um, if, you, if you miss the pads, then they have to go look for money to buy the, the sanitary pads, or you miss the school, so then you know, the narrative goes on and on. And then at the end of it, we're either getting sick or having teenage pregnancies. So the reusable sanitary pads has really been key in, um, in, uh, in, in promoting personal hygiene and bringing dignity to the woman. Because she's able to go to school, she's able to go to the market, um, and we make it in such a way that she's able to carry extras and uh, she's, she can be able to she'll wash it later. Um, some of the moving stories we do have when we are doing such, uh, such distributions is uh, a girl who comes and tells you that in my dignity kit that you're going to give me, um, I have a school I'm going to, but I really don't come back home every day. So I really, I really would like that... Uh, you can give me, if you're giving one, can I just have two? Because then my life is going to be so, so comfortable in school. I get so embarrassed during the time when I'm, I'm on my periods. So if I have this, really it's going to change my life. So these are things that um, you, you, you're, you're one on one with the, with, the, with the girls, for example, to give you such a, such a situation. And the women who are also doing this, they're going to make income from it. The skill they're going to learn uh, as we teach them a reusable part making, they learn the sewing skill, which then they make the other clothes that they sell to the women um, in, in their community. So we have, um, through Famamundi and the other the funders, we have grants for them to, to, do, to start the startup kits so that they're able to save. They have very nice stories of how they're able to save their own money and make the decision. We're talking about control here. Who is making the decision about the money that you're getting? She's able to make the money, the 300 Kenyan shillings, this is three euros or less. She's going to make a decision on, am I paying school fees or am I buying uh, some dress for the babies? Am I buying the uniforms? Because sometimes even that uniform is a hindrance for the child to go to school. And one of the things that they're also adding to the, to, to the whole story is I'm able to save some little money. And, and saving some little money in, in, in the economics part is really good because 
then um, um, you're developing your coping mechanisms. You're able to, to have this money, and, uh, and, and I know at the back of my mind, this is a backup for me. Because we have the same women in psychosocial support groups, like uh, some of my panelists are mentioning. So these women have these therapy groups too, that they work, uh, they, they meet with the counselors every, every other two weeks. Uh, later on, we will uh, graduate them to meet every month just to talk about other things. So they have this support group which uh, lines out their stressors, which would be just lack of, the lack of money. Then they have this group where they have been trained in skills and they're able to, to use that to make some money and she's able to, to run and, and being able to pay. So w when we put, put all these, uh, we are seeing uh, transformation um, mm -hmm. in the in the in the in the whole lineup, where mentally uh, she's she's getting uh, sorted out. Um, she's getting some income for this for her reliance and the self um, for for the livelihoods. And the same woman is in a support group, where where she's able to to also work with the other women. And 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 those 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 groups are very key because we also have uh, refugee led women groups that are in Kenya. And, and this, as an organization also, we, we find it very easy. Because when you go into a community, an organically formed group, uh, based on the other group dynamics that we, we have, uh, it would be easier to start and work with them. So they already formed, they had a purpose. And when you, you, you find such, then we use the existing structures to, mm -hmm. to have um, to, to run and to, to get the projects uh, running. One of the good policies that uh, has come uh, and is being implemented really well in our situation is when the women uh, had reached a stage where they are working and saving money, then because of their refugee status, for example, and uh, the banks only identify with the national identification. Um, so what happened is there's a lot, a lot of lobbying where they, they would um, then use the refugee mandate to open bank accounts. <coughs> so then they were able to, to open um, a bank account with certain bank, a specific bank, which has gone through and understood their mandate. So they're able to save their money in their name. Because otherwise, what happens is we have in Kenya what we call an m -Pesa system, where money is on your phone then because I don't have a national ID, then I would register it in, um, in his name. Um, then when the money comes, he, okay, it will be in his name, for example, um, so that I can save money. But it depends, maybe the one day he's not in uh, work talking terms and he can take the line. Or, so then the line is closed with all my money that I've saved in it. So that, that is also giving power to them uh, positive policies uh, that are that are uh, used um, lobbying um, coordination that is that is that happens in 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 programming, and this leads us now to um, yeah working in the private sector, working with the other sectors. So the coordination teams are very good uh, in sectoral thematic, because then we're able to to work really long in um, in, in situations like this. Uh, where we lobby, they get their, they can save their money, uh, they can have bank accounts, and um, yeah, so so the, that really really works. And of course, in the coordination uh, working groups, we have various organisations doing other legal aspects, and and so we're able to also internally do a lot of referrals and linkages um, among among the, the clients depending on their needs. So that has really also helped us a lot as a best practice in Kenya as we, as we work with, uh, with the urban refugees coming uh, to live in, in Kenya. Es que ricas que unís. Esto ha sido un ejemplo de que yo no he hecho la pregunta relevante, yo creo, porque le pregunto. This is an example of uh, I didn't make the right question because I was asking about a migrant policy, but it was also very important that Eunice told us about these experiences, the importance of the economic autonomy generating income on behalf of women. But we also speak about another important concept that has to do with the empowerment processes, the concept 
of autonomy, which is multifaceted and working from, for the property ownership of land is also related to this. And I'd like to connect this with the fact that in many of the experiences, a very strong strategy is that of support. As such, it was mentioned by Karina, I think. Was, was it? But support, uh, she was wondering about the route towards autonomy. And I think this is a very important idea. What's the way to autonomy? What's the route to autonomy? <laughs> Are we promoting it from the humanitarian action? Because sometimes, almost by definition, we can uh, go to practices that do not generate uh, autonomy, but they have to be trapped in this dependency relations. We depend on international funding, then those people may get dependent on us. And these dependency chains can be broken with plans of roots of autonomy, such as Karina mentioned. I think this is finding empowerment, and this is not done over a period of two, three years. And if I hear this route to autonomy, we have some reference here in the Basque Country. We have the route to change, and it was a video about the process in Nicaragua with an organization of women, and it is something I use in my lectures in order to translate this idea of empowerment. It's a process of about 12 to 15 years, and you see the results in the long run. So this obviously is one of the big challenges that lay ahead. But how do you see it beyond, beyond the projects? How do you see the aspect of a process? The organization Apoyar from Colombia, and Karina mentioned this before as well. Processes over and above uh, the projects. What are the routes to autonomy, which is what we w should finally aim at? Can we use the tools we have or they are not useful anymore? You, you can answer whatever you want. Back on the last two days we've had, um, the gender analysis tool is really key. And uh, apart, like, f for example, uh, as much as we, like, we do assessments and a lot of focus group discussions when you're getting the concepts done to be able to, to get the real needs um, as you're doing your, your concept development. Um, the RGA uh, is a tool that I think really can be useful useful in terms of at the beginning and then uh, during, during beginning, during, and also with the evaluation to really check uh, where we're looking at the impact or is it process number six, where we're like, did it really work or what really happened along the way? But uh, I, really, I really like the tool and um, we'd like to see how best, I know the other tools, like for example, when we were doing um, analysis in the households before we gave, um, before we started our income generation um, activities for like 25 women, we were looking for a tool and we had to, to get um, a SRI index, <coughs> self-reliance index tool. I don't know whether you know about it. But um, so the thing is, if, if you use it at the beginning and you have those variables and everything, you want to use it at the end to really see what the changes were, of course, uh, seeing what really happened. But the gender analysis tool, uh, there were so many other questions about what are the, the, uh, the variables in it and everything. I think it would be really interesting to, to engage the tool um, as, as, as we, we work in the, in the project. So it's something I think that we want to look at and see how to engage with it uh, and the various concepts of it. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that the context uh, surrounding the, uh, the target groups where we are working, 
and the NGOs where they are working has a lot to do with it. So if you want, uh, um, at the official legal uh, levels, it depends uh, if the government uh, gives certain rights uh, to the targeted woman or, or not. For example, in the example of Lebanon, no. The Lebanese government does not acknowledge any rights related to the Palestinian refugees and to the Syrian refugees. Uh, the Palestinian refugees have uh, enjoyed uh, this status for, 60, for, for, for 74 years. I think they are maybe the only people in the world who are still refugees since 70, yeah, 74 years. So if the government, uh, the host government, if they don't uh, acknowledge your rights, it means you are deprived if, to the right to, 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 to work, the right to ownership, and those are all problems that hinder any projects, especially income generating projects or economic projects, which might help those people if they had the rights, which they don't. So that context is very important. Uh, in order to, to solve the problem, uh, uh, there is the possibility of training courses so that they improve their situation, but at, at the micro level, and a small project, like for example, how to make soap, uh, 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 how to preserve food, because also the economic situation in Lebanon is terrible. Uh, so if they can preserve their own food, which they eat, or maybe sell it in the market. Those are possibilities, and we're working on it. There are other ideas, but you cannot make big projects with no rights, not, not, especially the right to work. Uh, and, and this applies for both target groups we are working with, the Palestinian refugees and uh, the Syrian refugees. So the context is very important mm -hmm. also on how you program your uh, uh, empowerment projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I go? Yeah. I, uh, I think the right-based abroad should be applied here for uh, for planning uh, any project or intervention or uh, using any tool. And uh, um, uh, sorry, what? also the, let's say, uh, the multi-sectorial approach. Uh, sorry, the? Multi-sectorial approach. Multi-sectorial approach. approach. It could be also uh, useful. Mm -hmm. Sí, tal vez, eh, nada más me... I'd just like to add, uh, add to this idea that where the process is more than the projects, it also involves constant reflection by the teams to find ways of creating synergies between different projects that could be ongoing and that could be joined to complement activities, but also to give continuity to processes in terms of looking at how to fit it in within lines that can determine projects, which is always complex because you also have to respond to a series of things that are prerequisites, but also need to carry out that exercise to see whether those, on the one hand, they need to acknowledge not only as an organizational commitment, which is also valid, but in the end, it seems that the, what there are is people's needs. And people point out what the support path should be in order to have inclusion and in financial autonomy, particularly in contexts of long-term crises, whether we'll need to generate income on an ongoing basis to establish themselves in the country and see how we can triangulate that between different projects that can have continuity or looking for those opportunities is a complex job, but we think is very important. And, uh, in relation to support and this path to autonomy for people, well, in context of migration, you need to know about the reality where in a system where migrants are numerally a cog in a system where there are dynamics of labor division. 
and they usually occupy a position in places like Costa Rica or any country in Latin America or the so-called third world. And that's also important to have it in the discussion and see what alternatives there are so that they can carry out other tasks. So they, what can their hopes be? Yesterday and today, the, we've heard about the, in the RJ, they not only take into account their skills and capacities, but also their expectations, the hopes that people have. For instance, when we worked with domestic workers, in part, their hope is to, at some point, have another job, not to continue to reproduce forever the a job that they had to to do when they arrived in the country because the only option they had, but part of their life hopes and maybe they might want to receive education and have alternatives that will allow them to develop their own ideas. Many of these people have ideas that they develop maybe at a very, very small scale, but which can, can be supported so that they can grow and be a source in some cases of additional income, and that will enable them to find other alternatives. The question correctly, but uh, I mean, usually we're talking to women and we have meeting with them. Usually they like uh, saying that a social empowerment need to be with economical empowerment. Social empowerment alone it doesn't work with women, especially like in marginalized area. Uh, I, I want to give an example for what uh, from one of the video we have watched today. I, I don't remember uh, the place, but they were saying you always take an, uh, inviting us for uh, trainings for workshop in and, Colombia. Uh, yeah, in yeah. Colombia, mm -hmm. and uh, but we didn't we, we don't have anything. We just uh, like uh, take the garbage or the cups, and uh, this is nothing for us. So. Economical, uh, uh, economical empowerment is very important, especially with social empowerment and capacity building programs. So it, you need to know him, to give women to know how to provide them with the means and to, uh, uh, to have a social empowerment, to have like the whole package. It's not only like social and training and capacity building. They need something physical also for like we have like a limitation on participation on women for like to attend their trainings or workshop because her husband or her brother tell her why you are going we are not good to get any useful from this training it's just waste of time but when we like we have a, we provide them with a program of capacity building social uh, communication negotiation and then we provide them with something economical uh, like land rehabilitation like income generation project this is will help them along empowerment and stop be depending on uh, on aid vamos a si vamos a abrirlo thank you all very much I'm going to um, relinquish my privilege. I've asked every question I wanted to ask. So now I'd like to hear your comments and also via streaming. I suppose we have questions. Linking to what you said and the, what Karina mentioned, processes over projects, I think that's essential. And my thoughts are linked to this. I was thinking that there are about four things that we need to organize. First people, then processes, then projects, and then paperwork or administration. And sometimes in the world of cooperation, we start by, with the administration, paperwork, projects, and we forget about the rest. And I think that's a challenge for all of us to have this clear and to f guide our work in this way. And also, uh, following what Karina said, it was after your first question, internally, what do we have to do? And Karina said that they attach a lot of importance for training spaces, care, um, for training the team, but also the most importantly is for what? To be capable to innovate and be creative. 
And then Adam, you mentioned this too. You said you, you do this too. And I take this as a challenge for all of us. If NGOs, humanitarian workers, Basque agency donors, if we're not able to take care of ourselves to innovate and create, well, this will die out. And my last thought is related to what Alan was saying now. I have a feeling that today we saw a very big paradox that we should think more about, which is the paradox between rapid and process. And I think on today's panel, we have process. People, you have been there for years, you're in local communities, you are local, you know about the processes. And the rapid emerges when you go in from through the process, but rapid externally is uh, it's like artificial. And I think we need to reflect on that. I think process and rapid don't really go together. I just wanted to share my thoughts. Horario crítico, ¿no? Vamos entrando. Sí. Ha habido preguntas. Have there been any questions via streaming? Pues me monto en el privilegio otra vez. Well, I'll take back my privilege of continuing with another question, or another comment. There's another thing that struck me was a very brief sentence, but I think was key by to, to about, I can't remember the name of the colleague, I'd like to name her, Gloria, from Colombia. She said, our best practice is listening. And I think that it's a simple key message where sometimes we aspire to innovation, but our best practice is to listen. And I don't know how you can dress listening up as something that's innovative, but I think it's eloquent and significant enough. And it connects with Luisa's intervention, what women were saying. We've been saying this for years, this thing about listening. Uh, so I was wondering, because it's being listening means prepared to listen to whatever comes. So in your work, what's the the people you work with? What's the question that you found the most that que the most questioning, that the most um, striking? What's the most transformative question? for yourselves or for your organizations that you've received, the most challenging question. I don't know if I've explained myself. Does it make sense? Imaginaos si lo llevo a decir en inglés. Que le repita de manera directa. Do you want to, to, to repeat it? Of course, uh, listening to your target groups uh, is, is very essential, starting from uh, the design of any program and during the program for monitoring and evaluation and at the end of it. So it is a process which goes on all the time, listening to your target group. Uh, but challenges, it, it depends on the context again, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the women, Palestinian women, have a certain challenge, which, for example, uh, uh, women in Costa Rica don't have the same. So it depends on the context, right, the challenges. And re what is related to Lebanon is a very complex issue because the women uh, are discriminated as refugees and they are discriminated as women. So we have double discrimination. This is the, yani, the situation as it is, double discrimination. Uh, the, the rights are not recognized. Huh? So yeah, so the major challenge in all our work with those women and the, the, the most important thing for them 
is to get their basic human rights. Right to work, right to health, right to education, access. They don't have the access. They are deprived of all human rights. So this is the base, the most important challenge which we face with our uh, women uh, and, and the target groups. Uh, other things are also challenges, you know, to improve their situation. How can we improve our situation? Uh, teach us, etc. Yeah, this is all there. But the major one is basic human rights, which they don't have. I'm, 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 I talked about the Lebanon, so we like to hear the challenges from our colleagues. Uh, for example, uh, does it? I know, I know listening means opening the space, opening the space for uh, what we call community conversations, um, and this these conversations are done. You conduct them with various groups. So you get a safe space for girls, a safe space for boys and men and women. So they're able to talk about their issues. Um, and like we said, um, somebody asked yesterday, how do you measure, how do you get aspirations and hopes? This is really important actually to, to talk to someone in that conversation. Maybe the project is WASH. So you'd hope that all the questions and the listening is washed. But then the water and sanitation. And then somebody would ask you something about maybe a road. Um, so you, would, you have listened. You pick up their hopes and their aspirations. And somebody asked in the morning, so what do you do with all that information? You have picked all the hopes and all the aspirations. It's always task, taxing or task not easy. As a social work person, as you're working with uh, with all these people, you saw the basket the ba uh, the bucket list of the women who are giving uh, the political uh, during uh, the presentation and, and the uh, in the video, and they had one, two, three each of them. I want this, I want that. So it's it's usually um, you take it one day at a time <laughs> after you listen. Um, you'll also be knowing really who you're dealing with because then you know as much as you are intervening in this sector, this is also what they would really want, their ideal situation. Mm -hmm. Some of it is out of your control, it's political, it's, it's out there. Some of their aspirations and hopes would be um, issues you can refer and link. Um, I'm talking to, to a group of women and uh, someone, one of them is just, just down and then talk to her and ask her like any, anything you want to talk about. And maybe her situation is just my papers have expired and uh, I'm not comfortable and I, I cannot walk around, I cannot go to the market, I cannot drop my children to school. So then in that situation, if you're able to then refer um, her or link her to, to, to an organization. Yeah, so it is really, um, Nice to listen, and very important to listen to to all all that that they have. So that is what I would really comment in that situation of of listening as a best practice as a social worker, because we are on the ground as social workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for for listening, here is come the role of the local NGOs or local organisation because it's a local response, like we are um, in Palestine or in our organization, we are like a proud of the data, uh, the, the volunteer base we have that is between, uh, between uh, communities and uh, uh, all the time in contact with, uh, with the, let's say, with the vulnerabilities and with the different groups. Uh, so we are always trying to listen to them, to their needs. Also, the, uh, also, uh, try to have the, the participatory approach in uh, from the whole process of the project, like mm -hmm. from the assessment the process <coughs> until the design of the process and the implementation the process. Uh, if you guarantee the participation, let's say inclusive participation for all categories in the community, you are listening to the whole community. Okay. Thank you. See, uh, que... Well, I think many questions can confront or in a way 
they clash what would we are doing and this is maybe unfair to <laughs> some situations but i cannot remember all the things that have been said but i think a fundamental issue something that has touched me is precisely the sustainability of um, the support uh, to a person mostly because there's a tendency to have a very immediate intervention and then you sort or fix uh, the fire but then uh, it goes on and then you can try and rebuild uh, something and i think at least in costa rica people are demanding not to be given something it's not you giving us something. We want you to help us find a way to find a job and be able to generate income by ourselves. We have these ideas. How can we implement them? So that kind of processes are quite complex, are long processes. They are not done overnight. And there's some formal aspects in a country like Costa Rica in which there's a huge load of bureaucracy and with a high fees that make it unfeasible for many people to have a small entrepreneurship project. And people, they have this idea of contributing because it's, it's something that the government says all the time. We don't want to be given something. We want you to help us move on and be able to have some income. And this is very much related to what has been mentioned here before, how to build dignity. Building dignity means something, being able to do things for yourself, being able that you can contribute to your community, the community you have just arrived in and develop that sense of belonging. And in that, in that discussion, between giving the fish or teaching to fish, these are good things and uh, sometimes we may need one or the other, but uh, maybe teaching is something we do not always do. And this is something maybe we should look at because there's limitations. Limitations that people may understand, but at the end of the day, uh, they are a hurdle in order to have a response. And this is something, it's a question, uh, it's a question that's very relevant to them. Thank you all. Are we doing fine with time? Yeah. Okay, we have a question there. Well, there's two questions via streaming. Well, there's a remark from Dasrak, who has participated previously from Uzbira in Congo. And it was about the rapid gender analysis, how it has to be contextualized. The contexts are very different, as we can see from this panel, and they require from adaptation. He said that maybe it would be convenient to have some minimum standards or a summary of rapid gender analysis in the three languages, at least. And I think the one by care is uh, in the three languages, at least. And this is something we wanted to, to tell him. And we'll send him the link. On the other hand, Pascasi Kaindo from Farmamundi in Congo goes back to an idea we have been dealing with, but he's, some, he's had some problems uh, with the connection, the internet connection, and he has missed something. And it may be a question for closing this conference. He asked, he would like to know what's the result we are expecting from a rapid gender analysis. Yo
Yo no he sido, ¿eh? It wasn't me. <laughs> ¿Queréis contestar algo? Would you like to answer any of you? Could you hear the question? Could you hear it, the results? What results would you expect from the application of the tool, from rapid gender analysis in your organizations? Well, maybe I could say, and maybe, well, I, I don't know what specific results we could obtain from a rapid gender analysis because I don't know the tool very well. I've never used it. And yesterday I was talking to my colleagues. We have to find the materials and maybe attend the training in order to understand and being able to use it because, because it's not only just filling in a form and just searching information. That's something that anyone could do it. You can Google something and then you have loads of information, but if, if you don't have the f capacity to filter it, well, I have understood that rapid gender analysis is useful in order to have incomplete information, which may be inaccurate, but that gives you some lights, some possibilities to spot places where there are needs, where you have to pay attention, where you have to maybe give a specific response for women, for boys, for girls, for uh, the LGBTQ uh, people in a specific context and also in relation to the available information about those specific contexts. It's not exhaustive, but there may be some information which in a process may filter and may analyze and maybe may have some elements that will help us make decisions which are more relevant and more related to the context in question in which you are having your intervention. This is the way I understood it. I don't know if my colleagues uh, think the same. Yes, um, I mean, I have uh, two doubts about uh, the rapid assessment, which is the having the quickly within like 24, 20, 36 uh, hours. Uh, the response it should be and I don't know if it's like uh, getting to you be is it useful to be used by local organization uh, I have asked the question yesterday but uh, is it like or tomorrow uh, this morning uh, is it useful uh, for local organization as for uh, the international organization and is it uh, useful for like the long term or in the human only in humanitarian humanitarian crisis or it could be like for organization more or development oriented uh, development organization so this is the two doubts we have <coughs> yeah. yeah i think uh, the same uh, almost uh, echoing uh, uh, tamador it's the, the, the RGA would like to see a situation where it can be used beyond rapid. And um, I think if we look at the tool, really, we should be able to see a situation where we can, we can go in and analyze um, the community or the target group where you want to to have a long-term or mid to long-term uh, project so that we're able to pick up all the issues. Uh, it may not be rapid like, like a, a real conflict situation, but um, I, I was looking at literally positively to be able to, to look at it as a tool and um, maybe ignore the word rapid, but take the gender analysis part of it. But for me, I, I really think it's a good tool for us to, to uh, put it to the, into context the, in, in the situations where we are working, uh, especially in our scenario, for example, uh, where we are targeting our target groups, um, persons in conflict in, in the country, and then they are transiting to a country which is their first, which is their first stop and then they're proceeding to a third country where they are, where they are living as uh, also refugees. So that tool would be really important f 
for our, for our project, for example, to be able to have the analysis and see what's happening along the line as, as, as they are moving from the country origin where there's a conflict and when there's landing as, as, uh, as, as, as refugees in a first country, what, what makes them, who moves? Is it the women? Is it the young boys? Which are the ages that move beyond, beyond a certain uh, country? So, so that's that the context of picking uh, and, and picking this gender in terms of their, the ages, the, the mobility status, and, and all this would be very key in, um, in, in making, um, making the, the project. So, so I think it's, it's, a really, it's a really nice tool that uh, we would like to see it, how it turns out if we delve into it more. And uh, I think adding to this is, is key to um, training uh, about its usage and application. I think it would be important to, to have this on board if, if we're able to see how then to have the application. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I like to comment too. And usually, uh, in countries uh, who are always facing conflicts, uh, internal or external or di or natural disasters, whatever, the NGOs working in those countries should be prepared. So they should have prepared preparedness uh, plans for emergencies uh, beforehand. And in those uh, plans, the gender issue should be included. Mm -hmm. So any tool will be needed in, in this case. So actually, when a disaster happens, the secondary information and the pri uh, 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 the secondary in information and the primary information, uh, the NGOs working in this case, they, they, they have both of them. They are, it's not like an international NGO coming to the country and they know nothing about the people, no? Mm -hmm. And so then they have to study from, from zero. Uh, no, mm -hmm. we already know mm -hmm. uh, our peoples. Mm -hmm. And we, in the plan of action uh, for preparedness, we already put several scenarios. So we know, not, not necessarily exactly, but in general what's going to happen. Scenarios, yeah? So when you study these scenarios, you already put all the study you need to support this scenario, you know, uh, to, uh, to support your response to this scenario, you know, including uh, gender mainstreaming and the z gender situation. Hello, whatever tools we have that help, and then of course there's the stages, before the di disaster, during and after the recovery phase. Depends what tools you need, in each case alone. And like my, my colleague said, and uh, all my colleagues say, it's the context, it's important. So I think the tool has to, serve this context in, in one way or another more. So we will, f we will see, we will find out. <laughs> pues muchísimas gracias. Thanks a lot. I would just would like to highlight the relevance of uh, contexts, the different contexts, uh, the context we are now uh, uh, on an international level of uh, growing strength of anti-gender speech, anti-feminist speech, the reduction of funding for gender equality and women's empowerment from the beginning of the 2000 on. The migratory restrictive policies we have mentioned before and all these elements of context, uh, not to talk about the particular uh, features in context of occupation here, we, we, we have mentioned Palestine and of course we have to mention the Sahrawi people and the situation they are living. Before we said 74 years, the population of Palestine over 40 years for the Saharan people in a territory occupied by Morocco. Eight experiences, different experiences, different nature of the organizations, diverse contexts. Well, I think you've had, your contribution has been huge in this panel. I'd like to thank you all for this. I'm not saying anything else because you have said everything already and very clearly. Thanks everyone for your attention. Have a nice afternoon. And now I think we are going to have 
the last cultural activity we have on the program. Bueno, Kaixo de Noi, Jardunaldi e Itxiera emango diego orain. Hello, we will close the conference and this is the final event. Elena Carriedo, as we mentioned yesterday, you've seen her, has been the visual acts of the different panels in the conference. Through the technique of graphic recording, she has been capturing the information and the main ideas as they were coming up. And now she will uh, make a brief summary of the minutes of the conference. And in order to finish, we have a small surprise, an act of collective creation we are going to have. So please stay around if you can. Thank you. Vale. All right. So, who holds the microphone now? <laughs> okay, I've been trying. Okay, bueno, lo hago en castellano. Okay, I'll do it in in Spanish, and so because we have translators, I have started in English. 
I've tried to uh, collect graphically everything that's been going on yesterday and today, what I've heard, what I could capture, a few things I have had to ask later on because I didn't have time, but I've tried to uh, capture the essence, like the synthesis, the synopsis, not everything, but maybe what we have left in here. And we're going to have a review of uh, this, and then we will give the floor to Sokole. Yesterday, they opened up the conference, the tier from Bilbao and Paul from the agency, Lankidecha, Basque Agency for Development. Isadora told us when her, with her storytelling how this was born, the three secrets, and how everything has evolved, how it has grown up, and how this Nespresso uses this very interesting tool. This morning, Ximena has been talking about rapid gender analysis. She has made a review of her uh, lifeline, the features, the key features, and that cycle, how the cycle works, five stages, search, collect, analyze, share, and maybe a sixth state in the future. It's a tool that is alive. As it gets used, it keeps on developing with pays tribute to one of the keys, speaking about imperfection, it's a progressive tool, imperfect and progressive. What do we use this tool for to enable the handling of data to find a solution to problems, which is focused mostly to associations with local organizations, and it's it, it tries to impact and it tries to have a more global impact. Then, after coffee time, Luisa Maria, well, Mireya has spoken about having an open mind and meeting five people. We are still uh, in time to do this. Then, Luisa Maria has been talking about Colombia, the experience in Colombia, how the situation in there uh, is hard. There's six ongoing conflicts. They have migrant population from Venezuela. Some are in transit, some other stay in the country. And she has mentioned the best practices and the importance of economic empowerment, how to do it carefully, and why it is important to have the gender approach how they integrate the approach. It is at the center, otherwise it's very difficult to make it work. And she has explained the case of leader women, uh, women living in emergencies and that transport their agenda. They have to raise their voice, take on very important roles and uh, how the change is taking place. And I have noted down one of the sentences uh, mentioned by one of the uh, women. Now I'm a leader in my neighborhood and a, a leader in my own house. I'm very happy. I think in that very small sentence, there's a lot of the essence of the macro information. Luisa Dietrich has told us about the new methodology through videos, participatory videos, video films, and with the study of who's holding the microphone and how using it we can spot opportunities and understand this is what we need to do. And uh, she has told us about uh, in the transformation, gender transformation, there's a change of power in the relationships, and she has spoken about processes. Everyone has been talking about processes, something that happens in the long term. And two remarks, final remarks, one of them, the impact of the actors and actresses, humanitarian actors and actresses is not neutral, not gender neutral. It's important to keep it in mind. 
And it's not only important what we do, but also how we do it. And finally, we've had the round table of experiences with different experiences. And again, we've been focused on the processes on women, on the need to protect women and girls from gender based violence, how it is important to have this gender approach. And also to train the teams who were with these women and girls and how the COVID has aggravated this uh, situation, has worsened the situation and how there's a uh, committees of women and groups of community protection, the clock of women. This was a concept mentioned by one of them in the video. It's an exercise they usually do in order to see what activities they do over the day and which of them are paid and which of them are unpaid in order to give value to all these activities for them to realize all the things they do and provide or give value to those activities. What else? Someone from the audience told us about for peace people process project paperwork and in this order looks like something interesting. And here we have the participatory panel where you have, thanks a lot for this, those key words that connect us with what suggests the gender issue within humanitarian action. And we see opportunity, sustainability, a fair, a more equitable society, window of opportunity, transformation, challenge, commitment inclusion. I think these are key terms which are really beautiful and they are the essence of uh, this conference. And now we have a gap for Sokole in here, which I'd like to uh, maybe um, reflect later on. And now you have the floor. Hello, good afternoon. While well, my colleagues well, we are just a few of us. Thank you for staying with us. I think it's been a very interesting and intense uh, conference. So we will end up with percussion, which is intense and deep because uh, these instruments, just like us, come from West Africa, from several uh, countries in Western Africa. And we, as we, as white women, from the respect and admiration, we like to uh, make some noise. You all have some instrument. If you don't, please let me know. And then here at the front, we will have yembes, which is this instrument here. And those of you who like to beat this with your hands, you will have six around. So if any of you feel like going here, and making noise, you can come here and do so. You have a powerful instrument here. Percussion is a very uh, powerful thing. Well, in the, in the meantime, well, <laughs> do not be ashamed to come forward. No shame. It's not that you are shameless. Not the not quite the same thing. Come here without shame. Come on, yembes. We have yembes. And in the meantime, I'd like to introduce you. My name is Elena. She's Sela, and we have Natalia as well. Do we have any yembes left? That's for you, Natalia. I think you, you want to use it. OK. Now we can play either yembe or the little eggs or the keys first. We will have a sound proof with the little eggs. Who has uh, the keys? OK. And then the yembe, you can play it with your hands. We have very many different instruments, so we can use our feet. Okay, there's the yembe. And we have the dunduns by Sheila. Okay. You can let us know when you want us to finish. The idea is to have uh, about 15, 20 minutes, but if people are happy, I'll go on. Thanks for waiting.
while we prepare everything. I hope you enjoy it. And let's learn with very simple guidelines how we can make a general concert. We've had the sound proofs. Now we'll try the little X, the keys, and the yembes, all of them together at the same time. Okay, again. One more. Okay, that's good. Okay, first thing we're going to learn is that in percussion, there's some very simple codes. Uh, there's uh, an entrance to rhythm. We are just a percussion group in here. The first principle, I'll, co I'll count up to four. And instead of five, we will make noise with the instrument we have, right? One, two, three, four. Okay. People already know what they have to do. Okay, another one. One, two, three, four. In several languages. I'll do it in several languages. The faster, the faster the first input, the faster the answer. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. Okay. We have the rhythm now. We have all languages and now the percussion language, which is a beautiful language and it's a way of transmitting through music. These four beats, we go back to the traditional, are divided in four beats. The call will be made by yembe and it's something like a song. Then this strike is the beginning of all the others that are, ca are coming afterwards. And when that call is within the beat, we will have the same two finish. And that will be the closure then. And now the mic. Can you hear me if I speak like that?
eso lo vamos a comentar, que quien no se aguante en los pies, la zona de por aquí, libremente también, si alguien se necesita desfogar bailando, que es bienvenida a la danza. Nos sacamos el basquismo de dentro y a bailar. Vale, vamos ahora a hacer lo mismo, ¿vale? pero vamos a hacer como por capitas. ¿vale? Estas percusiones más pequeñitas son igual de importantes. Gracias, gracias. Sí, sí, sí. Entonces, vamos a entrar por capitas. La primera capita, la primera llamada de Yepe, entran los huevitos, así la musa hoy también, pero entran los huevitos. El protagonismo a los huevitos. La siguiente capa se suma con las claves. Tic, tic, tic. Y la tercera llamada, ya entran los yemes también y ya todo ya por Vamos a probar las capitas del sonido. Hola. Vamos con los huevitos. Atención. y nos vamos con Socolet por allá a recorrer el mundo, claro que sí. Bueno, vamos ahora, vamos a hacer tipo esas capitas, entonces está el huevito que entra así y las claves, vamos a hacer un poquito más de apretar el... En vez de entrar check, 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 puede ser check, 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 que sería bat, bi, iru, lao. ¿Estáis cómodas ahí? Bien. Y el yembe puede hacer esta cosa. Entramos con la mano izquierda, por organizarla de una forma, y esta figura que es muy sencilla. Por ejemplo, ¿eh? si no es estilo libre también es bien. Pero, o sea, todo viene bien. pero si hay alguien que le quiera dar un poco más de rollete, las claves. Ta, 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 ta. Ta, ta, ta. ¿Bien? Huevito. Vamos por capitas. Igualmente entramos primero los huevitos, luego la clave y luego yembe. ¿Vale? Yo hago aquí lo del yembe también, para recordarlo luego. ¿Preparadas los huevitos?
notas igual no tanto, entonces así pues unificamos este instrumento que llevamos en el cuerpo, ¿vale? Entonces hay una tonadilla muy, muy sencilla. Estoy por ahí, ¿no? Se me pone la risa. Y me alegro, y me alegro porque ya es una risa que soy muy tímida, es para ya cantar sola. Pero bueno, es una cosa muy sencilla, una tonadilla muy sencilla que hace así, hace. Es la típica que hago yo y repetimos lo mismo el público. Pongo un poco de base para estar sola. Gracias por... Thanks for staying this while and I hope you have more energy and saying okay it's raining no problem thank you thanks see you the issue of instruments we will uh, collect them uh, at the exit and we may give some away if you have fallen in love with it you have a bag there as you go, the big ones, you can leave them where they are. Thank you, thanks.